This is Cynthia Van Ness, Director of the Library and Archives at the Buffalo History Museum, and today I'm recording Visit 3 of Mabel Barnes to the Pan American Exposition. This comes from her scrapbook, Peeps at the Pan American. Third visit, Thursday, June 27th, 1901. This was my first vacation visit to the Pan American. I went alone about 10 o'clock, entering the West Amherst Gate. I spent an hour looking for Mr. Cornett in the machinery hall, the agricultural building, and the stadium, finally finding him in the latter place. He walked me to the ethnology building, treating me to lemonade and a program on the way. The ethnology building, which I propose to do first, is classic in outline with Renaissance decorative treatment. The building is circular in plan with a diameter of 150 feet, having four arched entrances on a diagonal axis. Between and connecting these is a continuous colonnade with a decorative frieze over the windows above which are inscribed in rotation the terms Indian, Ethiopian, Caucasian, Mongolian, Malay. The colonnade is raised some seven feet above the level of the esplanade, giving a covered portico or loggia, which commands a pleasing view. Over each entrance is a quadriga supported on either side by torch bearers. The quadriga consists of four spirited horses drawing a Roman chariot in which stands a symbolic female figure. The building is covered with a dome like that of the Pantheon at Rome. This dome is capped by a decorative cresting which hides the skylight and is covered with red tile, while the color scheme for the side walls is light yellow. Surrounding the dome, in eight of the 16 panels, are eagles measuring 16 feet, and below these are eight circular windows lighting the upper gallery. Surmounting each of these windows is a sculptured group representing history, in which a sphinx is the central figure. On one side is a male figure with a skull studying man's past. On the other side, a youth looks up at the sphinx, seeking the secret of yet unwritten history. Over each entrance is inscribed the following quotation. O oh, rich and various man, thou palace of sight and sound, carrying in thy senses the morning and the evening and the unfathomable galaxy, in thy brain the geometry of the city of God, in thy heart the bower of love and the realms of right and wrong. Emerson. Around the dome, beginning at the right of the southwest entrance, are the following. The weakest among us has a gift, Ruskin. Speak to the earth and it shall teach thee, Job 12.8. And hath made of one blood all nations of men, Acts 17.26. No Sagano Zamora and Unohora, Cervantes. What a piece of work is man, Hamlet. All are needed by each one, Emerson. Knowledge begins in wonder, Plato. Nothing that is human is alien to me, Terence. The interior has an octagonal gallery extending around it, leaving an open space under the dome 80 feet in diameter and 120 feet in height. I spent the rest of the time until one o'clock exploring the ground floor of the building. The Mexican exhibit occupies the southern wing of the building. It consists principally of old models and views of ancient ruins, pottery, bas-reliefs, maps, plaster of Paris casts showing Mexican sculpture, frescoes of Teotihuacan, and cotton, clay, and woolen articles of ancient and modern Indian art. In the eastern wing is the exhibit of the French colonies, French Guiana, Guadeloupe, and Martinique. This exhibit consists of spices and aromatics, vegetable fibers, medicinal plants, tanning materials, seeds of edible and useful fruits, seeds and fruits yielding oil, dyeing materials, gums and resins, 
loofah or a dish rag gourd, fish scales, shells, bird skins, bead and featherwork, cordage hats, fans, baskets, mats, tissue paper, fish nets, implements, pottery, a vase made from the trunk of a fern tree, and a dress of a negress. An exhibit from the state of Washington is situated in the northern wing. This consists of stuffed birds, animals, and fish, illustrating the food supply of the Aborigines and the methods of Aboriginal hunting and fishing. Among the odd fish are an octopus, buffalo cod, halibut, chinook, salmon, carp, shad, grouper, all preserved in alcohol. There are also oysters and other shellfish. Near the Washington exhibit is an interesting collection of woven materials and implements of warfare from Samoa. Bolivia has an exhibit of hats, bags, and Indian curiosities. From San Salvador came a collection of coins, cults, knives, carved wood and stirrups, pottery, clay and stone idols, wood flowers, mummified frogs and reptiles, and human heads, the bones of which had by some means been removed through the spinal column, and the heads shrunk to about one-third original size. In the western wing of the building was a large collection of Indian games, weapons, and ornaments. In the center of the floor, immediately under the Great Dome, was a reproduction of the mode of burial of the mound builders as found in the Baum Prehistoric Village in Ohio. This exhibit came from the Ohio State Archaeological and Historical Society. Another curious object was a mummy from Peru. At half past, I ate my lunch in the Court of Cypresses, which is a quiet, retired spot, beautiful with a fountain, flower beds, cypress trees, and a sculpture consisting of water nymphs and river gods and goddesses. Then I rested while I listened to the following numbers played by Sousa's band in the East Esplanade Bandstand. One, excerpts from Tannhauser by Wagner, Wagner. Two, scenes from Falstaff by Verity. Next, I went back into the Ethnology Building, visiting the balcony, which is filled with collections of Indian relics of the Stone Age, pottery, and basketry, both prehistoric and modern, prehistoric implements of bone, stone, and copper, indigenous stuffed birds and animals of importance to the Aborigines, articles of Indian dress and ornament, canoes, Navajo blankets, and models of the cliff dwellings, pueblos, and Iroquois village sites. I also visited the Ethnological Art Gallery, which contains many fine paintings of the various ethnological types, Mexican, Hawaiian, Chinese, Indian, etc. One picture I liked especially. This was called Hiawatha's Vision, painted by J.W.S. Forster, Toronto, Ontario. After leaving the building, I heard the final numbers of the Sousa concert, including Largo from Xerxes by Handel, Heirs from the Bride-Elect by Sousa, and then went into the government building where I saw a biograph, stereopticon, and graphophone representation of the actual work done in the Washington, D.C. public schools, the Carlisle Indian School, and the Annapolis Naval Academy. At five o'clock, I went to the Temple of Music. This is a place of entertainment rather than for exhibition purposes, and is designed for orchestra, vocal and organ concerts during the exposition. It is a square-shaped building, but the arched entrances at the corners give it a circular appearance. It occupies a site 150 feet square. Upon each facade are richly ornamented columns between which are large window openings and ornamental panels, each bearing a portrait bust of some famous musical composer. The cornice, frieze, and balustrade are in the style of the Spanish Renaissance. On the balustrade are tablets bearing the names of the following musical geniuses, Liszt, Rubinstein, Berlioz, Gounod, Brahms, Abt, Rossini, Meyerbeer, Schubert, Ober, Offenbach, and Strauss. The entire building is surmounted by a tower, and this is covered by a dome rising 180 feet above the main floor. Star-shaped windows in the tower light the auditorium. The building is colored in light yellows with gold and red trimmings, and the panels on the dome are in light blue, producing an extremely beautiful effect. 
Above the corner pavilions are four groups of statuary. Down the northwest corner is the group called Heroic Music. In this, a bard is reciting his songs, inspired by a muse who with one hand is uplifting her veil, indicating the past, while with the other, she holds the wreath of laurel symbolic of the glorification of the hero. Gay music is represented by the group on the northeast corner. Bacchus, the god of joy and wine, is playing his flute while a bacante personifying gaiety and a boy representing humor dance. On the southeast corner is religious music. In this, St. Cecilia playing a harp is surrounded by angels who are playing and singing. Lyric music is represented on the southwest corner by a youth who, inspired by Eros, the god of love, is singing to a maiden. Above the four main groups are groups of children with musical instruments. The Temple of Music provides an auditorium capable of seating 2,200 people. A series of eight massive piers sustain the dome, and large arches between the piers open into balconies and galleries to the main entrance and to the stage. The auditorium contains the largest and best equipped organ ever built in the United States. On this organ, I heard the following numbers played by Henry Housley of Denver. One, Toccata and Fugue in D minor by Bach. Two, Concerto in F by Handel, including Allegro, Andante, and Allegro. Three, The Seraph's Strain by Wolstenholm. Four, Oriental March by Henry Housley. Five, Offertoire in E, Giovanni Morandi. After this, I walked down to the bank of the lake where I rested and ate my supper. On the way to the midway, I walked through the gardens surrounding the women's building. I was especially impressed by the magnificent roses by, and by Mexico's display of native plants, including cacti, begonias, orchids, camellias, agaves, etc. In the garden west of the women's building is a group of statuary called the Chariot Race. This group depicts a Roman chariot swinging around one of the meta or boundary posts of the arena. The curve is sharp as the leaning of horses and chariot indicates. The driver, balancing himself, holds in the horses on the inner side of the circle while the horses on the outside are given free rein. Arrived at the midway, I walked its entire length and then visited the ostrich farm. This consists of an enclosure of a quarter of an acre in which are shown about two dozen ostriches. The nests of the birds with eggs and feathers in the unfinished conditions are shown and the process of raising the birds, producing, curing, and marketing the feathers illustrated. Connected with the farm is a sales room for the ostrich plumes and feather articles. A race between the birds, which consisted in their being chased around the enclosure by a brindled horse and his boy rider, was a ludicrous feature of the exhibition. It, however, illustrated their method of running with huge wings flapping in the air. From an instructive point of view, the ostrich farm was interesting. The next place I entered was the large building constructed for the Johnstown Flood. As a mechanical representation of the phenomena of everyday events, the setting and rising of the sun, the pale blue effulgence of the full moon, the thunder and lightning of a terrifying electric storm, and finally, the stupendous burst of water that came over the town of Johnstown with the break of the dam, the show is a spectacle of lifelike appeal. A scenograph, the logical evolution of a cyclorama, diorama, and the scenic theater accomplishes its illusion, which is set on an ordinary stage and is in reality a performance in pantomime where all of the actors are stage properties. The curtain rises on Memorial Day, 1889, more than 24 hours before the flood. A grand army procession crosses the little bridge. The business of the town is transacted before the spectator's eyes, dusk comes, the lights appear in the windows, trains move across the line of vision, the moon appears, the night wanes, and the day of the disaster breaks, rosy and smiling. 
The hours pass until four o'clock in the afternoon when the trickling of the waters from the rivulets that fed the lake of South Fork, 14 miles away on the mountainside, undermined its half-century-old wood foundation and launched that avalanche of water down the Conemaw Valley, sweeping away 5,000 of the inhabitants of Johnstown and furnishing a disaster for which the history of the world has no parallel. Electric storm is made to burst on the stage picture before the arrival of the deluge, when the afternoon of May 31, 1889 was innocent of water from the skies. But under cover of the darkness and in the fitful gleam of vivid lightning, the spectacular effect is heightened. The cry of the talker, the dam has burst. His relation of the wild ride of Johnny Baker, a race between a flood and a horse, between life and death, the loss of the horse and the death of the noble boy comes with startling effect. Fire then breaks out and the debris erupt about the stone bridge. Hundreds of the dead and other hundreds of the living are imprisoned there. They are burned to a crisp. The Catholic Church, the field hospital, also breaks into flames. The rescued perish there. Then the fire dies away and the scene darkens. The turn of a hand measures the time of the change coming with the light, which shows Johnstown as it is today, rebuilt and flourishing. On the ground floor of the building, the management have provided parlors for the use of teachers. In direct contrast to the tragedy of the Johnstown flood was the reception given by Chiquita, which I next attended. Chiquita is Spanish for little one and is the name given to Alice Zenda, perhaps the tiniest human being and the most perfectly formed midget known to late generations. This sprightly little lady was born on the island of Cuba about 30 years ago. Her height is but 26 inches, though she is proportionately developed and she weighs but 18 pounds. She has a carriage and an automobile in which she rides, which are hardly large enough for a good-sized doll. She entertained us by showing us her proficiency in speaking several languages, by singing and by playing on her tiny piano. She shook hands also with each one of her callers. After bidding au revoir to Chiquita, I paid a visit to the Colorado gold mine. This was a representation of a gold mine in working order, showing the manner employed in wresting the precious metal from the secret rock-bound treasure troves of nature. It consisted of a large-sized working model in which miniature men, horses, etc., went through the various movements required of workers in a mine. Soon after returning to the light of day, or rather evening, I met Miss Gates and her mother who asked me to join them. I was very glad to do so, and we all walked the length of the midway again. There is an endless source of amusement in listening to the barkers in front of the various places of entertainment and in looking at the free shows given on the ballyhoos. So interested were we that we did not leave the grounds until after 10 o'clock.